The Last Man by Mary Shelley. So, if you know me, you will know that my favorite book of all time is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. This book is, to me, uh, the summit of all literary endeavor. It is also, I would aver, possibly the most forward-thinking book ever written, certainly at least to come out of the Enlightenment era, a work whose relevance only seems to increase as time goes by. But uh, despite cherishing Frankenstein as I do, I had actually never read anything else by Mary Shelley, but at last I decided to rectify that. Now, after Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's most well-known book, now at least, is this one, The Last Man. Now, what's interesting is that last year I actually read a book by the same title, an older book than this one by the same title, uh, which was Jean-Baptiste Francois Xavier Cousin de Grandvies, The Last Man. Maybe I'm pronouncing that name halfway correctly. Uh, but this book actually predates Mary Shelley's book, and this book actually, I think, is the first true example of apocalyptic fiction, of end-of-the-world literature. And I also think that this book uh, directly inspired at least some elements in Mary Shelley's The Last Man, uh, which I will talk about. Um, now, Mary Shelley's The Last Man is a pretty complex book. There is a lot going on in here. It manages to be both speculative fiction as well as very personal semi-autobiographical fiction at the same time. Uh, but before we get into talking about the story or any of the technical aspects of the book, first I think it would be good to provide a little background and context on the writing of this book. So when Mary Shelley undertook to write this book, uh, she was um, not in the best way financially uh, or socially uh, because uh, when, by the time she got down to writing The Last Man, she was pretty much alone. Um, Percy Shelley had drowned in a shipwreck. Lord Byron had died in the Greek War for Independence. John Polidori was otherwise removed. All of her children except one had died. Um, as regards her little band of literati with whom she circulated, um, the kind of romantic poets and such, like her husband and Lord Byron, she was kind of the last one standing. She was the last woman from that uh, group, I suppose. And she was in kind of dire financial straits because, of course, in those days, women didn't really have the greatest prospects for employment and um, financial independence. Um, so writing to Mary Shelley was not just the means for expression that it was to, I guess, Lord Byron, who was a freaking lord who, you know, was all set financially regardless of whether he published poems or not. Um, no, writing to Mary Shelley was a means for subsistence. It was the way that she put bread on the table for herself and her one remaining child. Um, and the last man... Um, notoriously bombed hard upon its release. In fact, the critical reception that it received when it was published was beyond just negative, it was downright hostile. And that is absolutely criminal as well because um, this book is um, ahead of its time in many ways, I think. Uh, but anyway, so now to talk about like what The Last Man is actually about. Uh, what story does this book tell? So, um, it takes place in the late 2000s. It's like takes place in like 2090 something. Um, for that time, distant future, actually, still pretty distant future for our time, actually. But you really wouldn't know that because basically nothing has changed technologically. Uh, from the time in which the book was written. Uh, there are no flying cars, there are no laser guns, there are no anything like that. The most advanced thing that seems to have developed 
is balloon travel, like hot air balloon travel. That's pretty much it. Otherwise, there is no technological advancement whatsoever from the early 1800s when this book was written. Uh, and, you know, I just find that kind of an odd choice. Like, you know, when you write futuristic fiction, um, is it better to just, you know, go all in with it and, you know, have the, the robots and the flying cars and the laser guns? Or do you just want to play it really, really safe like Mary Shelley did and just not imagine any kind of advancements, you know, but that's whatever. But anyway, so it takes place in the late uh, 2000s, like 2090 something, and it is narrated by, well, actually, that's the interesting thing. The book opens with a brief little introduction written by Mary Shelley herself, in which she states that she found um, this manuscript in a, in the a cave of the Sibyl in whatever country she was touring, which she actually did journey to. So it kind of has a very tenuous link to actual reality. Uh, but what's interesting is that that is basically the same setup as uh, whatever the hell this guy's name is, uh, his book, The Last Man. It has uh, basically a nearly identical introduction in which a narr uh, an initial narrator, in her case, Mary Shelley herself, um, enters a, a mystical cave and is revealed the story of the book that follows. Uh, but anyway, so after that introduction, we are introduced to the story proper, which is narrated by one Lionel Verney. Now, Lionel Verney's father uh, used to be a close confidant to the King of England. And what's interesting is that England is no longer a monarchy. It is now a republic. Uh, there may not be technological advancements in this book, uh, but there is kind of societal uh, changes evident in the story. Uh, so England is now an, a republic, not a monarchy, but Lionel Verney's father was a close confidant to the last king that England had before he abdicated. Um but his dad ended up broke, and so the, he, Lionel, and his sister, Perdita, grew up in basically just abject squalor, and Lionel was pretty much just a wild child. He was a leader of kind of a gang of hoodlums, and they would pull off all kinds of escapades and such, and he was kind of in trouble with the law. He was he was a real wild, wild child, but one day... um. Lionel encounters um, Adrian, who is the son of the last king of England, um, who Lionel's dad was friends with. Um, and he is a lord who has come to stay at his estates that Lionel has kind of just been traipsing all over. Um, and he civilizes Lionel. And Adrian, I should say now, is... Um, it's basically just Percy Shelley. Again, this book is heavily autobiographical, despite taking place in a distant future. Um, it's it's really kind of a Romanoclef. A lot of the characters are, are stand-ins for actual people. Um, and Adrian is basically just Percy Shelley, Mary Shelley's husband. Um, and he is basically a saint. This is Mary Shelley um, kind of tributing her late husband by depicting his fictional counterpart as this just golden-hearted, saintly kind of individual who tames the wild boy and kind of instills in him higher virtues and values and, and a sense of civilization, right? Uh, so Lionel grows up then in the company of Adrian, um, and then they both eventually enter politics. They have, like, seats in Parliament, um, Adrian, because he's a lord, um, and also this is where they um, encounter um, Raymond, and Raymond is the Lord Byron stand-in character, and Raymond is very much a rogue, just like Lord Byron himself was, and so the initial, like, half of this book, basically, is kind of a political drama a la all the king's men, kind of. Um, it's just kind of an intimate domestic drama with kind of a backdrop of, of English politics as Lord Raymond um, 
who is the Lord Byron character, initially tries to reinstate the monarchy with himself as the king, uh, but then eventually just kind of dicks off to go fight in uh, the Greek and Turkish wars. That's right, the Greek uh, War for Independence, the wars between the Greeks and the Turks, in this book are still going on in almost the year 3000. That's right. The wars between the Greeks and the Turks have been going on apparently for nearly 300 years. But anyway, so um, that's pretty much how the first half of this book goes. Um, and then uh, Lionel eventually goes to join Lord Raymond uh, in the Greek war against uh, the, the Ottoman Empire. Um, and this is where it really kicks into what the book is really about, what the title of the book has led you to, to think that the book is really about. That is the plague that destroys humanity. So whenever they, the, whenever Lord Raymond and the Greek forces eventually um, make their offensive against Constantinople, they find all the Turks already dead due to plague. Now, um, in order to write this book, Mary Shelley read for research, actually, um, Daniel Defoe's book, um, A Journal of the Plague Year, which I have here, um, and she used this as kind of a, a, a template for the disease in her book, The Plague. Uh, but anyway, so after they breach the walls of Constantinople, uh, the plague is kind of just unleashed on the planet. And the remainder of this book um, follows the quite rapid death of pretty much all of humanity and the ensuing societal breakdown until by the end, Lionel is the last man, the titular last man. He is the last human, apparently, left alive on earth, and um, that's the book. That is the story of The Last Man. It is very depressing, actually, and, and that is due in large part to the headspace, I guess, that Mary Shelley was in when she wrote this book. This is not a cheery book. It is not optimistic. It is very dour in its tone, and it becomes progressively so um, until the end where we have literally, it's down to one. Lionel Bernie is the last man, and after him, humanity is done. So, yeah, that is the story of The Last Man. Now, let's talk about uh, the technical aspects of the book. Uh, so, the writing in this book is, frankly, very, very beautiful, as you would expect from the author of Frankenstein, which is still the most beautifully written book I've ever read. I mean, you can take damn near any single line out of Frankenstein, and it reads like poetry, like like aphoristically, kind of. It's that gorgeous. Uh, the Last Man is written also very, very lushly, but... It's a little bit too much. She lays it on a bit thick in The Last Man. And if you don't have a real predilection for flowery romantic prose, you might find it a bit insufferable because, oh my goodness, does she go on and on and on. Um, just lavishing description on scenery and the emotions of the characters, and while it is beautiful, it is also unnecessary, and it severely drags down the pacing of this book, which is already very, very slow to begin with. Um, it it's it's very, very much <laughs> in terms of the writing. Um, so while it is beautiful to behold, there does come a time where you're kind of like, can we please just move it along? It's it's just too much. This book desperately needed editing. I don't know if it was edited or if whoever did edit it just didn't want to cut out a lot of that, but there's so much of this book that just needed to be trimmed down to a little bit more concise format. Um, yeah, but the writing's beautiful, but it's it's just too much. Now, as to the characters... Um, 
the characters, to be frank, in this book are pretty flat. And that was a real weakness, and that was a real disappointment to me, because the characters in Frankenstein are unforgettable. I mean, Victor Frankenstein is... Um, you know, the, 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 the stereotypical mad scientist, but you deeply understand his viewpoint, his outlook in the book. He's very kind of resentful at the way that things are, and he wants to change things to, to conquer death. Um, and also, of course, the monster is the, 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 the yearning, very forlorn, uh, outcast who waxes philosophical and poetic, very, very poetic uh, at times. Uh, and also uh, Captain Walton in, in the book, who, the, who is the character in the frame story and who ultimately learns from Frankenstein's story and then learns not to repeat the same mistakes. Like there's real depth to those characters and there's kind of arcs to some of them. Um, not so much with The Last Man. The last man, uh, it's there. The characters are pretty flat. They they are pretty flat, and that is a real weakness uh, against this book. A real knock against it is that the characters do not have much depth. They're kind. They are um, very cardboard kind of. Uh, Adrian, who is the Percy Shelley character, is just this just incorruptibly perfect saint, basically. Um, the, the, and then Lionel, the, the narrator, has little to no personality at all. He's basically just the means for recording this narrative. You don't know, I mean, you do know his backstory and stuff, but he just doesn't have much memorable about him. He's just not a very striking character. The only character in this that's actually kind of interesting is Lord Raymond, because that's, that's Lord Byron. Like, Lord Byron's personality was so powerful that it even shines through in a fictional counterpart. Um, he's kind of interesting, but then again, he dies, like, halfway through. So, um, that's the characters I can't really say are that great. They're very, very flat and kind of archetypal, but without the vivacity needed to at least be memorable or impressionable, it's the characters just aren't that good by and large. But now as to the story of this book. Now, this, the structure of The Last Man is, uh, by and large, its most striking feature. And that is because this book is not what you think it is about, or at least it doesn't become what you think it, it is about until well into it. Um, the title of the work, The Last Man, clues you in to the fact that this is the story of the last member of the human species at the end of the world, right? Um, however, it does not become that until about halfway through, and this is a pretty long book. This is so much longer than Frankenstein. Um, this Oxford World Classics edition here is 470 pages long. They may not sound the longest, but Trust me, it it's 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 a long book, and it's essentially two books, kind of two different stories, uh, shoehorned together. Kind of the first half of the book, thereabouts, is like I said, it's kind of just like all the king's men in a retro futuristic England. Um, n there's there's hardly anything that you could call a plot in the in the first half of this book. I mean, there's some politicking. There's lots of waxing poetic about the scenery and emotions and stuff, but like precious little actually happens until Lord Raymond goes to fight with the Greeks. Um, that's when the book really kicks in and becomes the story of the last man, when the plague starts. And I will say this, the back half of this book is much stronger than the front half. To be frank, the the initial part of this book I found very, very boring and not particularly engaging, uh, but the latter part of it really made up for that because once things really start going down, once the shit really starts hitting the fan, it becomes very compelling, I found it. It, it, is, it is a quite powerful book at that point. 
it becomes so uh, because and it really prefigures a lot. It, it really prefigures a lot of later apocalyptic fiction, the way that society breaks down and um, kind of the worst tendencies that people come out, but also the best tendencies in some cases. Um, and, you know, everybody's dying and this is like a rapid thing in just the course of a few years, the entire population of the planet is gone except for one man. Um, it is very grim and it is very reflective once again of Mary Shelley's, uh, the headspace that Mary Shelley was in when she was writing it. Um, and it's very effective, uh, at least in the latter portions of it, it really is. Uh, but thematically, what this book is about is an elegy. It is an elegy not only to the people that Mary Shelley had known and who were now dead. It is an elegy to their ideals as well. It is an elegy to romanticism. It is kind of the epitaph on the tombstone of that era, that moment in history which seems so optimistic and rosy, but for Mary Shelley, at least, it kind of didn't turn out as good personally as any of them probably would have liked it to be because, again, her life was very, very tragic. Um, and there is a lot in this book about um, the failure of art and poetry and stuff to really redeem human existence in in situations which are miserable, basically, because at the end of the book, Lionel is literally the last living human, presumably, on the planet, um, and yeah, that is, it's, that's maddening. He's, like, teetering on the verge of insanity, and he's, like, he's in Rome. He, he like, he eventually just travels all over, all over Europe, and he's, like, at least I can see all the works of art and everything, but he finds that that doesn't mean much to him because he has nobody to share those things with. It's just him. And then when he's gone, it's all gone. Um, and also, this the book, the cynicism of this book is kind of a carryover, I think, from Frankenstein. Because Frankenstein is a very, very cynical book. But it's all the more true to life because of that. And that's why I consider Frankenstein to be possibly the most forward-thinking book ever written. And for reasons that a lot of people I don't think might know, because everybody thinks that Frankenstein is like a warning about the dangers of playing God in regards to science, right? It's about, you know, scientific advancement that might have dire repercussions if handled improperly. And that is absolutely what the book is about in part. But what the book is also about is a sobering a uh, political warning, in essence. Um, not to go too deeply off into that, uh, but um, the 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 town that Frankenstein, uh, the character of Frankenstein, studies at in the book is Ingolstadt in Bavaria. And if you're familiar with history, you might know that Ingolstadt is also the birthplace of Adam Wiseau, who was the founder of the Bavarian Illuminati, the real Illuminati, not like the conspiracy theory kind of Illuminati that we have now, like the real historical Illuminati. Now, Adam Wiseau was a very evil and wicked man um, who propounded a lot of ideas, which I think, again, this is, this the, the Enlightenment was a real double-edged sword because there was a lot of technological advancement, but there were also a lot of dangerous theories that were being propounded by people like Adam Wiseau, which later snowballed into worse things that we need not mention. Uh, but there, for the longest time, and still I think, there was a lot of rumor that the Illuminati had a hand in the French Revolution. Now, I mention all this because Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley um, were living in a post-French Revolution society. Um, now, did the, did the Illuminati, like, cause the French Revolution? Absolutely not. But there have been persistent rumors that there was some kind of, they had some kind of hand in those events and perhaps pulled a string or two here or there. Um, but the point that I'm trying to make is that 
Mary Shelley, largely, I think, due to the tragic circumstances of her own life, saw things in a much more jaded light than her very idealistic husband. Uh, if, In fact, I, I read last year Percy Shelley's um, Prometheus Unbound, which is um, his kind of anarchic uh, hymn to revolution and societal change. And Frankenstein is, well, it stands in pretty stark contrast to that kind of sentiments because it understands after, again, having lived in a post-French Revolution society, people could see how direly wrong uh, movements like that could go. And that's why Mary Shelley's book has aged like fine wine, whereas Percy Shelley's book has aged like milk. Um, and I really think that it would just be hilarious if, if, if Percy Shelley and Mary Shelley had gotten to live to see the 19th century and see what revolution and societal overthrow and the relentless pursuit of equality actually led to, if they would still, or at least if Percy would still hold those sentiments. Uh, but I mention all this because The Last Man is a very, very bleak and pessimistic book. It has a very, very pessimistic outlook, which is, like I said, kind of the elegy of Mary Shelley to the Romantic era, the era of the Age of Enlightenment, right? As the dreams and the aspirations and the hopes that these people had for making their world this utopian paradise just crumbled into shit. Um, and that is why The Last Man has such a powerful effect, because it's kind of staring into the abyss. Um, and that's also why uh, the book had such a hostile reception upon its publication, because it was in such um, opposition, I think, to the prevailing sentiments of the day. Um, it was looking beyond them, I think. It was seeing the corruption, at, it was seeing the rot at the heart of the apple, I think, much as Frankenstein did. And that's why Frankenstein is such a vitally important book. In fact, I would say Frankenstein is one of the most important documents to come out of the Enlightenment. Uh, but anyway, the, the the last man had a just, it got savaged upon its publication. And I'm here to tell you that that is one of the greatest literary injustices that have ever been perpetrated. Mary Shelley's entire literary career was just a slew of failures, basically start to finish and from when she first wrote Frankenstein until she died. Pretty much all of her books were negatively received. Um, she actually had to obscure her gender, I think, at times uh, when she published because, of course, in those days, you know, women shouldn't be having those kind of thoughts that uh, that Mary Shelley was apparently having and imagining those kinds of stories. Uh, but I want to say this uh, as for as for the legacy of Mary Shelley. I want to say this for her sake, because her book, Frankenstein, means so much to me personally. There are a lot of authors out there, uh, or some certain select authors out there, who are not appreciated in their day. Uh, Herman Melville comes to mind first and foremost. Um, Moby Dick was a colossal failure when it was published, but now it is... I think, and a lot of other people think, the single greatest book that an American has ever written. Um, and Mary Shelley is the poster child of authors who were unappreciated in their own time. Um, her work is so good, I think. Frankenstein, again, I think that's the greatest book ever written, to me anyway it is. Uh, the Last Man, while not as good as Frankenstein, it has some problems, uh, is nonetheless an important insight into kind of an alternative perspective to the prevailing one of the era, I think, because Mary Shelley's work was kind of looking beyond um, the time period in which it was written. It was, again, very forward thinking, and The Last Man certainly is, not only because of the kind of pessimism regarding humanity, uh, but also because of the fact that it it basically prefigured 
a lot, the, uh, so much of the apocalyptic fiction that has followed it. Um, and so now to come to my rating of The Last Man, I'm going to give Mary Shelley's The Last Man a B plus. Uh, it teetered on the edge for me of giving it a B plus or maybe an A minus. But I think as much as I do cherish Frankenstein, I have to concede that this work has some flaws to it. It has some real shortcomings. Uh, the pacing of it is absolutely glacial. There's so much just extraneous um, flowery prose in this that doesn't really contribute to much. The characters are pretty flat, really. Uh, but the story in its latter portions becomes quite powerful and compelling. And also the themes that it was playing around with, the thematic content that occupies its heart, is such that I think it redeems it. Uh, Frankenstein is an absolute masterpiece. It is, I think, the masterpiece of literature. It is a book that I would give an A++++ ad infinitum to. Uh, but The Last Man, I will say, is a good book, but maybe not quite a great book. And thus, I am giving The Last Man a B+. Um, Again, solid book, and it is it is so unjust how this book was treated when it came out. Um, because it while it while this book does merit some criticism, the criticism which was directed at it when it first came out was not justifiable at all. Um, so Mary Shelley, you were a pioneer in many ways. You were ahead of your time, um, ahead of the curve, and this book, while maybe not as good as Frankenstein, is still an, a, a very strong book and a very striking book and one that can evoke some real uh, emotions in the those who read it, I think, or at least it did in me, especially in those latter pages. Um, so yeah, The Last Man gets a B plus. So, The Last Man by Mary Shelley. Have you read The Last Man? If you have, let me know down in the comments uh, what you thought about it, whether you have agreed or disagreed with anything I've said about it here today. And if you haven't read The Last Man, um, I could recommend this. If Especially if you're a, a fan of Frankenstein, if you like Mary Shelley and you want to give another work of hers besides the big one, a chance. I could say this is this is good. This is absolutely uh, a good book, and I would still today rank this as probably one of the best works of apocalyptic fiction, if only because it paved the way. I mean, so many of the elements that that we see in stories today, like Mad Max or The Walking Dead, or even The Stand, um, it all of that kind of can be traced back to this. Uh, and so I would say that, yeah, this is still one of the greatest apocalyptic works ever. So, yeah, I could definitely recommend it. But as always, if you have enjoyed anything you've seen or heard here today, remember to hit that like button and subscribe. I would really appreciate it. And until next time, peace.